to John chapter 4. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read the entire text up front because uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we will, uh, we'll, we'll get to the text, okay? John chapter 4, you know the story, most of you. If not, I'll just tell you very, uh, very quickly that what we're going to read, to, or what we're, what we're talking about today is an encounter that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman at a well. Jesus has sent his disciples on. They were traveling, and Jesus sent his disciples on to go get some food, ran to go to McDonald's or Arby's or wherever. And uh, he said, I'm going I'm to hang out here by, by this well. And the Bible actually said that he said, I, 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 need to just, I need to just hang out here. And the disciples went on, and as they, uh, as they went on, and Jesus was waiting there by the well, a Samaritan woman came. Um, in the middle of the day, at a time that that the, that one would normally not come to draw water because it was the hot part of the day, and and it was a time that um, that it was uncommon that one would come to draw water at the well. But she came, and as she as she came with her uh, with her water pot to draw water, there she met this man named Jesus. She has an encounter with him that absolutely turns her world upside down. And the big part of, um, in fact, it's the first time that Jesus reveals himself, like audibly reveals himself, specifically reveals himself as Messiah to, 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 and, and, and that we see in Scripture. And it's, 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 it's this awesome, powerful, life-changing experience for her that centers really upon the subject of true worship. And we started this series last week uh, called Real Worship, Hope Cries Out. And I just, I, I, I just got to tell you that it's important that we have a hope. Amen. I know that we've seen some disturbing things and uh, even on the news this week. And, and there are disturbing things. There have been disturbing things for a very long time that we've seen and that we've uh, that we have uh, uh, that we've heard about and the headlines, but I just got to tell you, it's important that we have a hope. Is there anybody? Thank you. Is there is there anybody that's got a hope in this place today? Just just I don't have answers, but I have a hope. I don't I don't have I don't have a, a game plan. I don't have a strategy. I don't even know what, what what the next step is, but I have a hope. I have a hope. We need a hope. And if you're here today. And you can't even say, I, I, I don't even, I, I don't know that I even have a hope, but my hope is waning. I pray that before we leave this place today, that if God does nothing more for you today than this, that this would happen for you, that God would reignite your hope. That God would reignite your understanding, that you can put your hope in him. That he is hope, amen, the giver of hope. Jesus is my hope. My hope is not in the things of this world. Amen? My, my, my hope is in Jesus. Is there anybody today that could just, just right now, just as a praise to God, I, my hope is in you, Lord. My hope is in you. Listen, I don't know how good I'm going to preach today, y'all. I'm just going to tell you that up front. I, I, I feel a very, a very different... Uh, spirit and presence uh, in this place. I don't know. I don't know how well I'm going to preach today, but that shouldn't matter. Here's the thing: I am going to share with you the Word of God, and the Word of God carries with it hope. Amen. And we can put our hope. We can put our trust in that. Hope is powerful. It is that hope that cries out uh, from from the depths of our souls, uh, the depths of our souls to the heart. Of an upright and righteous and holy God who's worthy of worship regardless of what the world throws our way. Amen? In the midst of tribulations, he's still worthy of our worship because he still is the giver of our hope. Amen? In the midst of persecution and trials and troubles, he, he's, he's still worthy. Amen? This is why we worship. He's still worthy. In hardships, he's worthy. When I'm on the mountaintop, he's worthy. When I'm in the valley, he's worthy. Does anybody know about that God? 
Does anybody know about that God who's worthy regardless of what's going on on my plane? He is high and he is above it all and he's worthy of worship. When, when people around me are, are, are going crazy and things are happening that I just can't wrap my mind around and I just don't understand, but he is still worthy. When I'm doing my best just to hold on and, and not lose my mind altogether, God is still worthy. Amen? When the spouse is getting on your last nerve, I didn't say mine, but on yours, uh, he's still worthy. Right? It's alert. Um, when the house is a mess and the cars broke down and, 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 and the kids, you know, had better do something or, or other uh, if they know what's good for them, you know, God is still worthy. When the preacher don't preach good, God's still worthy. Amen? When they, when they didn't even sing my song today, he's still worthy. When the world's gone mad, nothing makes sense. How many know that he is still God and he's still worthy of worship? See, I don't, I don't worship the Lord because everything's right with the world. I worship Him because even in a messed up world, He is my hope. And He is my refuge. And He is my comfort. And He is my shield. And He is my stay. And He is my God. And He is still in control. And He is always worthy of worship and as long as I have a hope just a hope I don't have answers I may not have a clue but if I have a hope then that hope within me cries out to a God who is able to take that very glimmer of hope and, and, and cause it to ignite in the space of faith and do great and mighty things that I could not have even imagined and, and, and cannot comprehend I have a hope today. His name is Jesus. Amen. And in our text today, this woman, this Samaritan woman, meets this Jesus, the very subject of hope. He is hope to a world that had, that, that, that had lost its way. He is hope to a hopeless existence. He is, he is hope. Jesus in this encounter, in this time, in this encounter of hope and, and revelation of Jesus, it stirred something up in this woman that simply could not be contained. I'm going to pray and we're going to go to John chapter 4, verse 28. Father, help me uh, not to get ahead of you. Speak. Uh, uh, to each one of us today by your spirit and through your word. Lord Jesus, we lift you up because you are our hope. And we're so grateful. I'm so grateful for you. Speak in these next moments, God, into each one of our hearts. Help us and anoint us that we might hear and receive, comprehend and apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. John 4, I want you to look at this. If you're not familiar with the whole story, read the whole story. Um, but I but, but I want to jump in here. John chapter 4, verse 28. It says that the woman, this is after she had had this, this encounter with Jesus. Now, she had come to draw water from the well. And she had come carrying this water pot. And the Bible said then in verses 28 and 29 that the woman, after this encounter, she left. Her water pot. That when she left the place, she didn't even bother to pick up the water pot because something had changed. She left her water pot. That means that she she abandoned her previously perceived purpose. She thought she was there for one reason. But she realized that there was something much bigger going on in that moment. See, she abandoned the status quo. She, she abandoned the everyday mundane rigmarole of, of, of just like business as usual. When she found out what life 
was really about. And the Bible said that the woman left her water pot and she went her way into the city and saith to the men, to the city folk, come see a man which told me everything that I ever did, meaning that he knows me better than anyone has ever known me. He truly sees me through the mess and through the brokenness and through the shell of defense and through the walls that I have built up and through everything that, 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 I, have, that I have gathered and amassed just to allow me to cope and get through this life. He sees me. He truly cares about me. He truly understands my heart. She is saying, I finally found what I've been looking for all along. That, that, that void in my soul that I've been trying to fill. That longing for intimacy that, that I've been trying to find in, in, in wrong relationships and, and, and failed marriages and, and, and misdirected pursuits. I finally realized that it wasn't a physical relationship that I needed or even a deep emotional connection that I've been yearning for. What this man, what this Jesus helped me to see is that there is a void, there is an absence in my spirit that can only be filled by way of a genuine spiritual connection with my creator, the God of the universe. And she concludes by saying, is this not the Christ, the chosen one of God? The Messiah. See, when you truly know who Jesus is, you can't help but give him due honor. You can't help but worship him and make him known. This is a it's an awesome, it's an awesome passage of scripture. A truly wonderful account of, of a truly awesome and wonderful encounter, which if you keep reading. To the end of the chapter, you'll see that this encounter that she has with Jesus brought about some awesome and wonderful results in the lives, not just of this one woman, but of many. I want to dive into this passage today and see what lessons that we can glean from it concerning the subject of, of real worship, true worship, authentic worship, the, the type of worship that God truly desires, and what it means to be a true worshiper. Um, look with me here at verses 23 and 24. I realize I've got to get moving. Um, here's what it says. Jesus is having this talk with this woman, and they get to talking about um, they get to talking about uh, their differences in their understanding or their people's understanding, I should say, of, of where is the proper place, the appropriate place to worship. And she said uh, the Samaritans there, uh, the Samaritans believe that it was it was in this place that, that that God can really be heard and God can really be seen and God can really be known. And, and Jesus, of course, being a Jew, said, uh, said, said the Jews uh, worship in Jerusalem. And, 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 and they're having this discussion. But here's what Jesus says in verse 23. He said, but the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him, for God is is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, there are two things that, uh, that I need to do before I give you some points that you can take with you, okay? Two things that I need you to understand here before I get into those preaching points, all right? Two little uh, word studies. Anybody like doing word study? It's probably my favorite aspect of, of, of reading and studying scripture. It's just kind of finding a word and, and searching it out and breaking it down. 
But let me just do a couple of quick ones, okay? Because it really will help us to understand true worship and the type of worship that God desires and how we can meet that desire, okay? The first, um, we'll just take care of this up front. The first little word study is this. It's the word in this passage, the word must. In our, in our English translations of verse 24 here, it says that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And when we read that, we say, well, okay, that means if we're going to worship God, that we must worship him in this certain way. But when we look at this word, when we trace this word that is translated in our English translations, this word must, when we trace it back to the original language, actually what it literally means is need to, or more specifically, have a need to. So what Jesus is saying is that God is a spirit and they that worship him have a need to worship him in spirit and in truth. Can I just tell you, church, that if we will not break the mold and the pattern of, well, I guess I'll go to church and I guess I'll engage in worship a little bit because I know that God needs or desires or requires or wants my worship. So I'll go ahead and I'll do my duty. As long as we look at worship that way, we miss the entire point of worship because, yes, God is worthy of worship. And yes, God deserves worship. But can I just tell you, though, if you don't worship him, God will still be worshipped. God will still be honored. God will still be lifted up. But the reason that you and I need to come into the house of God or come into our, our place of worship at home or come into the presence of God in worship is not because if we don't worship him, nobody will worship him. No, 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 no. Rocks can worship God if they need to. But I don't want any rock cried out in my stead because here's what Jesus is really saying. We need to worship God in spirit and in truth. I need that moment. I need that experience. I need that fresh anointing. I need that fresh oil. I need that fresh encounter. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody that would say, I don't worship because he needs it. I worship because he's worthy. And I need to be in his presence. Do you want to know more heavenly? Do you want to know why you just can't seem to get in the right head space, absent of worship? That the longer you spend, you go without spending that 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 time with the Lord, that you just the harder and harder it is just to just to make sense of anything and get in the right head space. Do you want to know why when you neglect to worship God, everything just seems off? And you have this overwhelming sense that, you know, like we talked about last week, something just ain't right. Here's why. Here's why that is. Worship is a sort of uh, spiritual lifeblood. If you will, there, there, there is an internal, intrinsic need within the spirit of the creation to worship and thereby connect deeply with the creator. And when that need, when that desperate longing is denied, it throws not just one, but every aspect of our lives out of balance. If you do not worship your creator, it will not just affect how you walk into church on Sunday morning, but it will affect how you love your husband or how you love your wife or how you train your children, how you, how, how, how you operate in your everyday life, how you, it will affect every area your life because there is an internal need need to connect with your creator here's the bottom line we were created to worship 
We were created for the glory of God. We were created to glorify God. Now, here's the second word study. Lord, help me. Second word study that I need to share with you. Um, I don't even know if I told you the title of my message, but I'm, I, I, that's okay. You probably would have looked at me funny anyway because the title of my message is this. The truth about cats and dogs. I said, what in the world does that have to do with worship? But let me do this word study with you and maybe it'll make a little more sense. See, Here's the second word study that we need to that we need to do. Oh, there's not a cap on that. I'm glad I didn't sweep it any harder. And it, it is. Uh, hopefully, it will bring some light and help you to understand that that odd title. See, the word in this passage that we just read, the word worship. When Jesus says, "God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth," this word worship. Um, that's translated worship in our English Bible is a word that really gave uh, translators um, quite a bit of trouble because it's a really complex Greek word. And when I say that it's complex, what I mean is that it has multiple branches and origins and, and, and roots, okay? Uh, the, the Greek language is kind of like a tree. It has root systems and branches, and, and really to trace some words, to trace them back, you've got to really look up and understand a whole lot of other words just to get to this word. And so this word that is translated in our English Bible as worship is one of those very words. It is, it's, it's very complex. Um, it's, a, it's a really complex word that many people understand to simply mean, and certainly when you trace this word, um, it, is, it is among the many branches of its definition are the concepts of uh, 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 definitions of like to fawn or to crouch to or to bow down. Or to prostrate oneself in, in homage. Or to do reverence to. Or to adore. And certainly all of that is encompassed in, uh, within this word. Those are all branches of this word's definition. But when you begin to look at the root words. That this Greek word. The Greek word is proskuneo. Proskuneo. And it is, it is derived from, interestingly enough. It is derived from, so when you start to reach uh, into the root system and see where this word comes from, what you'll find is that perhaps the closest translation, translation or definition of this word is simply a kiss. A kiss. I better put my glasses on to see which one of you are looking at. Okay, proskuneo is the Greek word. When you really trace it back, probably the most sim simple, boiled down, um, concentrated uh, form or understanding of the root is, is a kiss. A kiss. Well, that's really weird that Jesus said God is a spirit and he's looking for people that will kiss him. Right? That's, that's, that's the, that will give him a kiss. Um, so when Jesus tells the woman true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth and that the Father is seeking such to worship Him. He's not saying that God is looking for worshipers who will um, uh, uh, sing a beautiful song or play a certain style or genre of music or, or that will stand while singing or, or, or will bow in God's presence or will lift their hands and surrender or dance or jump or twirl or shout or cry or bow down or bow their heads solemnly or kneel or whatever expression of worship that you may have in mind that may come to your mind when you hear the word worship. Jesus isn't saying any of that. And understand that there's certainly nothing wrong with any of those expressions of worship, but none of them truly define what Jesus was actually saying. Because what Jesus was actually saying is that God is looking for someone who will give him a kiss. And I, I know, I know that's crazy and that sounds odd, but, but you're probably thinking, 
thinking, wait a minute, Pastor. I don't know about all of this because, because this, this is kind of getting a bit weird. But as that the old infomercials used to say, but wait, there's more. Because when, it, it, when you study it out, you'll see that it's not just any kiss. It's not the way you kiss your wife. It's not the way you kiss your mama. It's not the way you kiss your babies. It's not just any kiss. Because when you trace this word all the way back to its roots, you find that it's the type of kiss that a dog would give its owner upon the owner's return home. Anybody ever had a dog? Mm -hmm. A good one? Uh, dogs are kind of, dogs are kind of, can I just say stupid? Uh, some, 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 some dogs there. Like, here's the thing about a dog, y'all. Dog, maybe stupid's not the right word, okay? Dogs just have this, this happy connection with their, with their masters, right? Like, they just have this happy connection with, with their owners. Like, dogs are crazy in that you could lock your dog in a trunk for hours, Right? You could lock your dog in a trunk for hours, and when you open that trunk, that dog would be happy to see you, would jump into your arms, would lick your face, and just be so happy to see you and say, yeah, that's the way it ought to be. Really, try, try, try locking your wife in a trunk for her. <laughs> Don't really do that. You will not get a kiss when you unlock the trunk. Right? But, but dogs are like that. You probably see you've probably seen it on uh, on Facebook or YouTube or anything. These videos of people who come home and they've been away for a while and their dogs just go crazy for them, jump into their arms and crawl all over their heads and you know whatever. And that's ter That's all right if your dog weighs like 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 five pounds, but it's terrible when it weighs like. 50 pounds, right? You know, you don't want a dog crawling on, on your head like that. But they're excited and they're so overjoyed just to be in your presence. And Jesus, when he's talking, he says that this is how God. Amen. This is this is what God, this is the type of worship that God desires. A dog-like kiss. So when Jesus said that, that's what it means. That's what this word proskuneo means. So when Jesus says that God is looking for that kind of worship, he's really saying, I'm looking for hearts that are so desirous of me. I'm looking for hearts that so desperately long for me that, that they will hold nothing back and they will leap at the very thought of being in my presence. And when I think about that, I, 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 the first example that comes to my mind is the example of Elizabeth. You remember the story. And she is pregnant with, with, with baby John, who we will come to know as John the Baptist. And the Bible said that when Mary, after having her encounter with the angel and understanding that she is the chosen one to bring forth the Christ child, the Bible says that she goes to stay in the home of Elizabeth. Okay? And when she walks in the door, Luke chapter 1 and verse 41, it says that when Mary, pregnant with the promised Son of God, when she walked into the room and saluted Elizabeth, John, inside Elizabeth's womb, began to leap. And, and, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost and began to prophesy. All Jesus did was step in the room. Now, I don't know about you, but that is the kind of worship service that I sign up for any day of the week, right? Jesus said that's the kind of worship that the Father's looking for. God says, I'm looking for souls that cannot contain themselves because they're so excited that they get to be with me. I'm looking for hearts that explode with ex expectation and anticipation and affection at the thought that the Master has come into this place. I'm looking for worshipers that will jump fences and break down barriers in order to make their way into my arms and give me the worship that I deserve. That's what it means when Jesus says that God is looking for true Worshippers. Proskuneo. Now then, here's the problem. 
I put this on a slide because I don't want you to let this slide. God is looking for dog-like worship, but most of us worship like cats. That's the problem. That, 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 that's the problem. Somebody just say meow. Okay. See, that's your last one because God's not looking for cat-like worship. He's looking for dog-like worship. And that sounds a little like a, like a silly statement, but, but what do I really mean? If you walk into the room with a dog, they go crazy. Oh, my, my person's here. Awesome. If you walk into the room with a cat, it doesn't care. Right? Like it does not care. It doesn't move. Most of the time, it won't even bother to look in your general direction. And if it does, the expression on its face is like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Right? Oh, great. Here comes one of those annoying people things again. You know? Why do you think it is that in the movies, the cute little puppy dogs always play the good guys and the cats always play the bad guys? It's because art imitates life. Think about this. No cat has ever bounced up and down on its perch like a spasmatic pogo ball upon hearing a car door close or a doorbell ring. Right? Like, they don't care. They don't care. No cat has ever left its high and lofty perch and run to its owner upon their return and leaped into the owner's arms and, and, and excitedly crawled all over the owner's head and face, lavishing him or her with affectionate kisses just to let them know, oh, sweet owner, I'm so glad you're home. No, all they'll give you is a meow, hiss, go get me some tuna. <laughs> right? Like, because here's the thing. <laughs> See, that, that, that just don't... That just don't happen. Like, oh, I'm so excited that you're here. No, Mr. Furry Devil Razor Claw has never done that. You want to know why? Here's why. Don't miss this. You want to know why the cat doesn't go crazy when the master walks in the room? When the owner walks in the room? It's because the cat thinks it is the owner. The cat thinks it is the master. As far as the cat's concerned, the cat doesn't exist for you. You exist for the cat. It's all about Garfield. That's cat-like worship. And sadly, it's the common mindset of most so-called worshipers. That God, I don't exist for you. You exist for me. God, I don't exist for you. You exist for me. So, so as long as you keep doing what I want you to do, I'll go ahead and let you. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, 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 and call you my God. As long as I'll, I'll go ahead and throw a couple hallelujahs your way from time to time. As long as you keep doing what I want you to do. As long as you keep blessing me. As long as, as you don't require me to do anything that I don't like or I don't feel like doing. As long as you don't ask me to leave my high and lofty perch of comfort and convenience. Then yeah, I'll be your cat. But if you don't make me happy, look out, God. <laughs> you know. That's cat like worship. Understand that cat like worship, worship that says it's all about me, is not true worship. It is not real worship. It is not authentic. It is not genuine worship. It is not the type of worship that God not only desires but deserves. True worship is dog like worship. It's worship that says, it is all about you, God, and for you, God, I will go all out because you're my master. And I'm excited just to be in your presence. So Jesus is saying that God is looking for those true worshipers who will make it all about him and worship him in the way that he truly deserves. Okay? But why is this important? And I realize you're really scared at this point because I've done all of this preaching 
and I have not yet given you any points, and you're scared because you know that at, at, at the very least, there's probably at least three of them coming at you, right? Okay, but we'll kind of, we'll get through these real quick because I have to tell you this. Jesus is saying that God is looking for true worshipers, and this is important. It's important that we become true worshipers, genuine, authentic worshipers of God. And why is it important that we, ab that we abandon our cat-like ways and embrace this type of worship that resembles this all-out, exuberant, excited affection and adoration that a dog has for his master? Why is true worship so important? I'm going to give you three answers to that question real quick. Are you ready? Um, anybody need to order a pizza before we get going? Okay, all right, all right, here we go. Uh, I, I want you to look at our text, and I'm going to show you three things that true worship does. Here's number one. True worship produces a spring of life-giving encounters and fresh anointing. Look here, verses 13 and 14. John 4, 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, what is this water that Jesus is referring to here in verse 13 that will surely leave one thirsting again? Well, first of all, he's speaking in the literal, obviously. Uh, that, that's the first layer of this. There's the literal meaning that Jesus is referring quite literally to the physical tangible drinking water in this well that this woman has come to gather. Jesus is saying if you draw out a cup of water from this well and you drink it and go about your way, not long from now, especially in, the, in, in, this, in this high heat, uh, under this hot sun, not long from now, you will be thirsty again. That's pretty easy to understand. But then there's a figurative meaning as well. And I believe that um, that that figurative meaning is that um, he's speaking of the water of days gone by, the water of history, the water of, of tradition, the waters of, well, this is the way I've always done it, or this is the way I, I, I was brought up to do it, or this is what I've always understood it to be. And, and, and I'm a creature of habit, and how can I expect at my age to change my worship patterns and to change uh, my, my, my understanding of, of worship at this point in my life? The woman said in verse 12, she said, are you greater after he says, you would have asked me for water, and I would give you this water. And she says in verse 12, she says, Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? What's she saying? If it's good enough for mommy, it was good enough for me. If it's good enough for daddy, it was good enough for me. If it's good enough for grandma, grandpa, great-grandma, great-grandpa, and all that, it's good enough for me, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't that just sound like and remind you of this really common mentality among many good Christian folk today? It's this, it's this idea, folks who just don't seem all that interested in pressing in and paying the price and receiving a fresh encounter with God, receiving a fresh anointing from God, are just sort of content to live off of the testimonies of those that have gone before us or the things that we've seen before or encountered or experienced before, the stories of what God did in days gone by. Very much like those that Jesus spoke of in uh, John chapter 4 and verse 22 when he said, You worship, you know not what. He's saying of the Samaritans, you don't even know what you worship. You're worshiping God, but you don't even know what that means. You worship, you, you, don't, you know not what. You're just going off things you've heard. Don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with appreciating history, right? Nothing wrong with honoring certain traditions as long as they line up with the Word of God. But there is something very wrong with allowing our embrace of history and tradition to stifle the fresh move of God's Spirit and the work that He's trying to accomplish in our lives today and every day. He is the same God, yes, that was with Noah and Moses and Joshua and David and Daniel and the three Hebrew children and the disciples and Paul and Silas and Timothy. Yes, he's the same God that was, uh, that was with your mom and your daddy and grandma and granddaddy and great, 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 this, that, and the other. He is that. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. But that same God said in Isaiah 43, Verses 19 through 21, and 
I'm just going to let you know that this is really a, a life verse that I feel like God has uh, just been pouring into me as it relates to really the time that we're in right now and what God is doing and wanting to do right now uh, in, in our midst. I really feel like this is the verse that the passage that the Lord just keeps bringing me back to. He says here in Isaiah 43, 19 through 21, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He said, the beasts of the field shall honor me. The dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. And then he says in verse 21, this people have I formed for myself and they shall show forth my Praise. The word that the Lord declares is that His mercies are new every morning. Lamentation chapter 3 and verse 22 tells us that. That's why Jesus said to the woman in verses 13 and 14, if you drink of this water, you will thirst again. It can temporarily soothe you, but it cannot sustain you. But then he says, whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give shall never thirst. Because the water that I shall give shall be in you a well of water springing into everlasting life. Is there anybody in this house that needs that water? Yeah. I just pour, pour that water. Pour that water into my life. True worship produces a spring of life-giving encounters and fresh anointing. Let me tell you the second thing real quick here, okay? And that is the true worship reveals the real longing of your soul. It reveals the real longing of your soul. Um, John 4, 15 through 19, let me read here. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. I need that water. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. This is the part of the conversation where Jesus really begins reading this woman's mail that her eyes get really big like this and she just goes through that, how could you possibly do that? Right? And this is the part of the conversation where she begins to realize there is something far greater than what I thought was happening on the surface. There is a spiritual context. There is a spiritual element, a supernatural element to this conversation that I'm having. And, when, and, and at the end of it all, she says, sir, I perceive you're just not, not just another man. You're a prophet. That there is something awesome and powerful and mighty and spiritually significant about you. He reveals her innermost struggle. He's saying, until, until now, your life has been defined by a series of failed marriages and broken relationships. She'd been looking for love. She'd been trying to find fulfillment, uh, uh, something to fill that void in her spirit all of this time in all the wrong places. But now Jesus comes along and he tells her that it doesn't have to be that way anymore because he has come with the living water of life. And what's interesting is that if, as you're reading, immediately following her revelation that you're not just any other man. I perceive that you're a prophet and I need what you're offering. If you're reading immediately after that, the conversation changes to focus on the subject of what? Worship. Why? Because if you truly want to get your life right, you have got to draw close to the heart of God. closer you draw to the heart of God, the more you will begin to understand how undone you are without Him. And how truly how much you need Him. And nothing draws you closer 
to God's heart than worship. Look at verse 29, John 4, 29. After all of this, she leaves her water pot. Water pot. She runs into the town that previously she had done everything she could do, including gathering water for herself at the hottest point of, of, of the day, just so that she didn't have to be around the town folks who made her feel uh, worthless and, and, and dirty and, and, and no good and didn't want anything to do with her. But after she meets Jesus and she gets close to the heart of God and she has this revelation of who he is and that he's revealed himself to her, and here's what she does. She runs. She runs. back into the town and she says come see a man which told me all things that ever I did and then she says is this not the Christ I just met the one that we've all been longing for understand that once she came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and she got her worship in order. Her attitude, her whole perspective changed from I need a man to come see a man. I need something. I, 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 I've just got to connect my something, myself to something of worth because, because I, I find no worth in myself. But now, but now she's had this encounter with Jesus that emboldens her to say, I don't care where I got to go or how they look at me. I'm going to proclaim. I've just met. I've just encountered. I've just been in the presence of someone who has changed my life forever. Why? Because true worship reveals a real longing in your soul. I'm wrapping it up. I'm just going to, I, I, I promise. True worship, here's the third thing. I'll tell you, true worship combats confusion. This is, why, this is why we need to be worshiping today, church. True worship combats confusion and reveals the true nature and presence of God. Jump in here at verse 20. John 4, 20. Our fathers, she says to Jesus, our fathers worship in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We worship what, uh, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. For God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. And when he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Jesus said, listen, you Samaritan people worship what you don't even know. And, and my people know what we're worshiping for salvation is of the Jews. And yet everybody is getting it wrong. Because everybody is so wrapped up and so confused by the question of where is the best place to worship? It sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like exactly where we are. Like, like, like there's all of these debates. Like, like what's the best church to worship in? Is it the new fancy like auditorium with lights and all of this and, and great sound and or is it the old school like like we don't even we don't even have a sound system and the piano's only half tuned and you know what, what, what's the most holy you know what's the best church to worship in or, or who has the best worship program or is worship about sound and lights and pyro or is it about solemn and silent meditation or is worship best to the sounds of a bellowing pipe organ or booming drums and rocking bass lines and, and screeching guitars or, or we, we ask questions and wonder things like does God prefer his worship leaders to be in choir robes three-piece suits or skinny jeans? Like, like these are big questions in the, in, in, in the world of Christendom, right? Does God prefer hymns, hillsong, or hushed tones by candlelight? It's, it's, we, we all have, I call it worship wars. 
You know what happens when we get involved in worship wars? A lot of people die. When we get wrapped up in worship wars, a lot of people die. There's a whole lot of bloodshed and a whole lot of fallout. It need not be. All that these types of questions will ever do is to create confusion and, 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 and stir up these worship wars and divide the people. So Jesus is saying, everybody, we get wrapped up in all of this stuff, everybody is missing the point. Because true worship is not about any of those things. True worship, real worship, is all about God. His worth. The word worship, the word worship literally comes from these two worth shit. It is, the, it, is the, it is the worship, it is the worthiness of God to be worshipped. It's about honoring Him. It's about focusing on and expressing His worth and thereby establishing a true and life-giving spiritual connection with our Almighty Creator. That's what true worship is. When we put the entire focus on Him, he opens our eyes. He heals our lives. He fills our lives with His presence. That's why Jesus said, that's why Jesus said that true worshipers must, meaning have a need to, worship in spirit and in truth. Because that's when God truly has full unobstructed access into your life. When I can say, God, this moment is not about me. It's all about you. God says, now I can move unobstructed in your life. And that's awesome. True worship combats confusion and reveals the true nature and presence of God. So, in summation, as I close, I promise, true worship produces a spring of life-giving encounters and fresh anointing. True worship reveals the real longing of your soul. And true worship combats confusion and reveals the true nature and presence of God. See, here's why I tell you all of this. And we're going to get into uh, next week. Don't miss next week because we're going to get into true worship and how we can offer that to God. Okay? Um, but... Uh, God is looking for some true worshipers who will lay aside these cat-like ways, right? And, and like excited little puppy dogs will go all out in worshiping the master, the creator, God, almighty, and spirit, and truth. And that's the truth about cats and dogs, right? That's why it, that we have this odd little title. So let me ask you today, as I close, truth about cats and dogs. Here's, here's the question. Let me ask you, which one are you today? In fact, I put that on a slide. Um, I think maybe I did. It's not. It's, there's not one. Okay. Uh, I, I thought I did. But let me just say it again. Which one are you today? Are you a cat like worshiper or are you a dog like worshiper? It's a big question, right? Which one are you today? It's a very big question, but here's the even bigger question. Here's the far more important question. <coughs> Which one will you be from this day forward? Which one will you be from this day forward? And I thought I loaded up these slides and, and, and I had... I had a couple of practicals for you. Remember last week I gave you, okay, last week I gave you some practicals, just like things that you can do, just to, you know, if you want, if you want to release the Holy Spirit of God in your life and in your worship, I told you last week, make time, even if just five minutes, to get away with God each day. Did anybody, did anybody do that this week? Well, if, if you did, great. If you didn't, it's not too late to start, okay? Make time, even if just five minutes, to get away with God each day. Second thing I told you was to get one verse or one passage that draws your focus to the person, power, and goodness of God. 
and then and, and to rehearse that every day in those in that time that you get away with God. And then I give you this little prayer. Holy Spirit, I invite and release you to move freely in my life and through my worship. So I'm going to leave this up here, but I'm going to add one more to it today that you can add to this. So if you've been doing this for the last week, that's awesome. Um, but I just want to make this really practical. Um, give you just one more practical, one more thing that you can add this week. And that is this last one here. Play or sing a worship song to the Lord. In that time that you get away with God, that you step into the bedroom or the office or maybe even literally just, just hide in a closet from your, from your spouse and kids. Five minutes, ten minutes, how long it is. If you just go through this list, you say, that seems really simple. It is really simple. It is really simple. And the idea is not that this is where you hang out for the rest of your life. But the idea is you've got to start somewhere. Amen? Worship is not something, listen, listen, worship is not something that God just throws on you and says you're going to whether you like it or not. No, worship is something that God invites you to enter into. We, do you still looking at that? Let's just put that slide up. We'll just leave it up as, as we're praying and as we're leaving here. That's, that's all fine. That's all fine. We'll just put that one back up here. So this is the one we're adding. Just on your phone, find a song. Go to YouTube. Go to if you've got a song that just really resonates with you and just really helps you to focus on on who God is and 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 and, and, and just just maybe load that up, uh, whatever. Or maybe you don't even listen to it. Maybe it's not even about the sound and the music or whatever. Maybe it's just a song in your heart that just said. Do you not realize that the Book of Psalms is really a collection of things that just came up that just 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 began to arise in the psalmist's heart. Play or sing a worship song to the Lord. Maybe start there. Maybe just when you enter into your time with God, just start there with that, with that little song to the Lord. I worship you, Almighty God. For there is none like you. I worship you, Prince of Peace. That is what I long to do. I mean, I don't know what your song is. That's a pretty good one. I give you praise for you are my righteousness. And I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. I don't know what your song is, but just give you one. It just brings you into the presence of God. Amen? Make time for him. Let the word of God wash over you. Read that verse. Don't just read it with your eyeballs. Open your mouth and begin to read and declare that word, that, 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 that verse of Scripture, that passage of Scripture. Read it aloud. Read it unto the Lord. Let it wash over you. Let it become a part of who you are. Ask the Holy Spirit. Pray. Just release the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit to move freely in your life. Amen? I believe that if we'll start somewhere, God will take us somewhere even greater. Amen? So here's the thing. I'm going to pray. And I realize this, this message went longer than I had hoped for it to do, that I had planned for it to do. I preached a little more on it than I had planned uh, maybe to do on a couple of these points. But listen, I believe, I believe that God, God is not looking, just looking for people who will come in and go through the motions of worship. God is looking for people who not just on Sunday, but every day of their lives will say, God, I, 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 I'm going to take the time to worship you and give you, give you, give you time that maybe I don't even feel like I have, but I'm going to make that time and give it to you, God, because more than anything in my life, I need your presence in my life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, you are, you are so good and your, your word is so powerful and life-changing. God, I realize that not everybody